Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, and welcome to a very special extra interview of Final Cut today. I'm joined by an actress who I have admired for decades. She starred in such movies as Pitch Black, Phone Booth, Man on Fire, Melinda Melinda, and Silent Hill. They're just a few of the movies she has done, and I, for one, can tick a name off my interview bucket list. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is with, with great honour and privilege that I introduce to you a member of the Aussie Soap alumni, Rada Mitchell. Hi, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Now, now, can I just ask a question? Your full name isn't actually Rada Mitchell, is it? It's actually quite longer than that. Uh, it's a little longer, but, I mean, just for uh, to keep it simple, Rada Rani Mitchell. Fair enough. Is it, is that, there's about, what, five, is, it, is it five uh, five names in total in your name, aside from, there's like four names and there's Mitchell as well? <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's a few. I've got options. Fair enough. Then. I have but, options, yeah. which is always good in life. It is, yeah. So, uh, obviously, the inevitable question is, how did you get started out in acting? Because, if I'm being brutally honest, you were made for film, seeing as your parents were, one, a filmmaker, and two, your mother was a model turned fashion designer. So, literally, you were quite the perfect package <laughs> for filming, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I did have, I guess, some pretty interesting influences early on. Um, how did I get in? I My mum had me modelling when I was a little kid. So uh, somehow through that, um, somebody wanted uh, to cast a TV show for about um, like young girls in the 1920s. And so I got cast and I sort of left school for a couple of months and did this little show and then went back to school and somehow by doing that show I got an agent so through that later on I decided that I'd like to explore acting so I did that uh, when I finished school but yeah it was initially through having the exposure to the modeling world which was obviously my mum's background. Mm. Right so uh so obviously, as you were growing up, you obviously had some influences, uh, like how you, the way you wanted to act. So who were your influences growing up? Well, I mean, I used to go to this, um, like, vintage art house cinema. Uh-huh. My mum was friends with the owners. So I watched a lot of, like, old 1940s movies. And I don't know, I think... The first actress that really left an impact was Natasha Kinski, and I thought Ooh. she was really cool. Um, yeah, I saw all, all kinds of movies. I mean, probably movies that were inappropriate, like Clockwork <laughs> Orange. Like <laughs> everything was going on at this Ooh, theater. Oh, you naughty, naughty girl, you! Very naughty, very naughty. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, yeah, my I guess seventies cinema was like an early influence. Seventies Australian cinema as well, European cinema, um, and you know. From a very early age, of course, Shirley Temple <laughs> was always my hero. I would always watch the Shirley Temple movies, which were on a Sunday afternoon. Um, they were super, super like early influences. Um, but I guess you know, you know, as an actress, sort of a, a more on a more serious level later, maybe it was like the seventies cinema and that kind of a, that era that influenced my sensibilities. Mm. Two of the great influences. I have not actually heard Natasha, Natasha Kinski's name for oof, God, when was the last time I heard that name. It has actually been a, few, it. it's been a few decades since I've heard that name, but I do actually I did actually oh, like wait. her back in the day. Yeah. Oh, I think she's amazing. You know her whole you know crazy background. Very interesting actress. Mm. Um, I don't know what she's up to of late, but um, I think she just had that sort of poetic kind of in, uh, kind of intensity. Mm. Um, kind of sensuality. She just sort of obviously left an impression. Maybe just the movies that I saw her in. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this lady is one of the Australian contingent who's done uh, Australian soap. So that bo- that has bode very well for her career. So, is that actually how you think of it? If you if you star in an Australian soap, you are destined to do well in Hollywood. Well, I mean, the reality is, there's not especially when I was there, there wasn't a lot of uh, things to do. Mm. So soap, you know, soap was school for actors, basically. You get on the soap and you'd learn how they kind of act. Um, and so you'll see everybody that's anybody pass through Neighbours because Neighbours has been on for 
40 years, 30 maybe. years now, yeah. 40, yeah, like forever. Um, and still has like a strong audience. Um, and I don't know how they can sustain that, but they do. Mm. Um, so it just seems to be, it's just one of the, one of the jobs that's available <laughs> in, in, in Australia, particularly in Melbourne where I'm from. Because I was actually looking through the list of people who's actually been in the three, the two main soaps and Blue Healers, what you also in, and the list is just absolutely astonishing. I mean, there's just for an example, so everyone knows, there's the Hemsworth brothers; they've done both. Uh, Samar Weaving's oh, okay. done, done both. Uh, Russell Crowe's been in one. Emily Browning's been in one. Guy Pearce, Isla Fisher, Melissa George, Naomi Watts. Hugh, Hugh Jackman was in Blue Healers. Even I didn't know this. Really? Yeah. Wow. They should rerun all these episodes, don't you yeah. think? It would be I was, amazing. I was literally, this is, first thing I did with you is, I did re- <laughs> I do research as everybody else does, and I was just looking like, oh, yeah. she was in Blue Healers. And I was just like, right, recurring characters. And I was going down the list, and there was just like, when was Hugh Jackman ever in this? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of the first job you get, you know, yeah. out of acting school or out of high school or whatever it is. Um yeah. There's these episodic TV shows yeah. in Australia, and there isn't a whole lot else. And there's a couple of movies in, that they're making, and now mm-hmm. these days there's a lot of American films that get made. But um, you know, initially there wasn't really anything else to do, so yeah. that's probably like the first job that Hugh mm. Jackman ever had. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it'd be would, quite interesting to see it. All right, would you dare me to tell Ryan Reynolds about this? Uh, if you like. <laughs> you know Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds are in the middle of, like, a Twitter war? Oh, are they, like, best friends on Twitter? I don't, I I don't know if they are. <laughs> I, think, I don't know, too, actually. I think the line's been a bit blurry ever since um, Ryan tried to plug one of uh, Hugh's... Uh, I can't remember what it was he tried to uh, plug. He did it very nicely, but then Hugh Jackman kind of uh, severely messed up one, one of uh, Ryan's, and it's just kind of gone a bit downhill ever since. Come on, I think they're joking. They're going to be joking. I might tell him anyway. Just let's have a... anyway. So, uh, so I guess the uh, well, you I didn't actually know this until I did my research. But you've actually been in both Blue Healers and Neighbours. So, if we're going on the uh, soap contingent, we could say that you were destined to succeed in uh, in America. Uh, well, let's yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> Let's go with that. It's the stepping stone. Yeah. It's the first step for any Australian actor is like a couple of weeks on Blue Healers. And then you know you're an actor. Yeah. And then you see what happens next. Yeah. So obviously you did the Aussie soap scene, you did a few movies, and then it got you recognised with a greater audience. Then, and this was the first time I saw you as an actress, was a certain uh, Vin Diesel movie called Pitch Black. Oh. Well, no, there was... I did actually around the time of Neighbours, I did a little Australian film Mm -hmm. called Love and Other Catastrophes that a friend of mine, uh, her dad paid for it. Like, it was a very cheap movie. Really, uh, basically made by a bunch of film students. Mm -hmm. And um, it ended up getting sold to Fox. Yeah. And so we went to the Cannes Film Festival. So that's how we got agents and, and so on and sort of got some sort of step into L.A., um, and from there, I was able to do the meetings, and uh, I got cast in a movie called High Art. And mm-hmm. after that, I did a movie called Pitch Black. Yeah. So it was kind of like one, two, three, I guess. But obviously, first time I saw you, I absolutely loved you in that. I actually, uh, I, said it here. I actually said because uh, what I loved, even though you had like Cole Hauser, who is probably one of the best uh, villains that I've ever actor villains I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, he's you had really him. good. Yeah, and you had Keith yeah. David, the legend that is Keith David. But you really, I yeah. thought you held your own really well, because bearing in mind uh, that sort of is kind of like, yes, I'm going into a movie with Keith David, but I am actually holding my own, and I was absolutely quite impressed with that. So you could say, oh, that's nice. so you could yeah. say Pitch Black not only elevates you into the mainstream as an actress, but it also proved that you could hold a starring role regardless of the uh, fellow cast members you had. Uh, yeah, well, I guess so. Um, yeah, there, there was, it was definitely challenging in that, you know, there was a yeah. bunch of dudes on set and a lot of testosterone. Um, so there was, you know, I think the tension that's in the movie is everyone was very serious yeah. while we were shooting that film. I mean, we had fun, but also the mood on set was very focused and very serious mm-hmm. and all the tough guys had to be tough. And, you know, it was something to kind of 
hold my own against that. It being like my first, well, second American film, yeah, third movie, I guess. But um, but I mean, it was required, I guess, for the character on some level. Yeah. Now, to be fair, we could talk about uh, Pitch Black all day, but I'm just gonna move on rather quickly because. You were actually in Joe Schumacher's uh, phone booth, which was that. Mm-hmm. I thought it was quite an interesting movie because it's all set in the daytime. It's filmed in like uh, 24 vision, as in the TV series 24. And was it actually yeah. filmed in 12 days? It was. It was shot really quickly and it was all shot in downtown yeah. LA, you know, posing as New York. But there was a lot of like interplay just with the local people that were living down there, some of whom were homeless. So the, the sort of set was quite open. <laughs> there was just a lot going on. Um, and masterfully hand, handled, obviously, by Joel Schumacher. Yeah. Um, and withheld. They decided, I forget what they were waiting for, but they'd finished the film. There was one guy who was playing the voice, and then, I guess, for whatever reason, they recast the voice with Kiefer Sutherland yeah, later. Yeah, I, I remember that story. And... And then they reca- then they held the movie waiting for the lead actor to become some kind of a sort of presence in Hollywood. And I forget what movie came out first for Colin, but after that, then they released this movie. Mm-hmm. And I think that was good timing. There was, I forget, some issue also that was going on. I don't know if it was a shooting that was happening in real life yeah. or something also was going I think on. I, I think I remember it was that wasn't it a uh, like a high school had been shut up, so they decided to uh, hold release back for a couple of months until yeah, until kind of died down. Something sh- yeah, something kind of shocking happened. Mm. So I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was a high school shooting. Yeah. Wow! Now nowadays that just is so much part of American culture they don't mm. stop anything. Um, anyway, so yeah, that was that story. Was it well? It's a two-part question. This was it harder to film than it actually looked, and was it weird for you knowing that you know it's like you're on set for like six months, but you finished it in twelve days. Were you kind of like twelve days have gone filming and finished, and you're like, does it? It doesn't even look like I felt like I finished the movie. It feels like I'm just starting. Well, I think the way they shot it was all sequential, so it was it was like a stage play. We were at, we shot the first couple of scenes, then the next, then the next, so that the momentum of the movie built as it would in real life. Yeah. So it kind of was like a stage play. I mean, it was all around this sort of one location mainly. So it was possible to do that, um, mm. whereas normally, I guess, that wouldn't be possible because <laughs> you have to like move your story around. Yeah. So it was very really efficient in that sense. Yeah. I actually found out something doing my research that you might not be aware of regarding that movie. That What's sense? that? I actually found out something while I was doing my research that might interest you about that movie. Yeah. You might know this. I don't know if you do know or not, but it was actually going to be made... That movie was actually going to be made by Alfred Hitchcock. No. At one point, yeah. Did me research, did as much as I could, and it literally came up on wow. a page. Forget which one it was. It was a case of Hitchcock was going to do it, but he actually passed on it. No way. Yep. So, Who wrote it? Uh, so it's a nine. When was it? Oh, Hitchcock. He was yeah. directing into Hitchcock, the seventies, yeah. right? Yeah. Or when did he stop directing? I can't remember exactly. Uh, I don't know. It must have been about late seventies, early eighties, because I think late seventies. Yeah, was yeah. When, uh, so it must have been a later, a later yeah. Hitchcock script. Because I was thinking, wow, could that have happened in the nineteen forties? Um, but he had a long career. He did. Yeah. Okay. I can. He would have done a great job with it. I presume. You know, with his sort of suspense and timing. Um. Yeah. So you Obviously, it happened. It happened shocked. at the right time. So, so <laughs> yeah, right I, bet you're bit, I bet you're a bit shocked by just hearing that, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting, interesting. Mm. I'm just trying to imagine the Hitchcock version because I'm sure he would have done a great job with it as well. I wonder if he would have cast me. He might have. I don't know. <laughs> I see what I see. What I really don't like about that movie because I've always because as an actress, I think you you are basically one of the nicest. Uh, you play the nicest characters that you could actually think of, and it's like, why would you cheat on a character like that? It's just not normal. <laughs> That's so sweet of you. That's. Not, I don't know if that's true though. I think I have played some not nice characters. A few. But, yeah, um, I would say back then it was a case of I'd only seen you in Pitch Black. I'd seen you in uh, uh, Man on Fire as well. And uh-huh. so basically, all the movies I'd seen you in were when you were actually quite determined, or you were actually a nice person who did not deserve 
to in well, in Colin Farrell's <laughs> case, cheating. Like Colin on. Farrell. <laughs> but hang on, I mean the issue it's Colin Farrell, so yeah. he would be cheating on anybody. And it's Katie Holmes, so you know, it's not exactly um inconceivable. Mm, well. But should we just leave that? We'll leave that up to the listeners' uh, brains, shall we? Because I, for one, think Let's it's definitely... Leave it up to the listeners. Yeah, we will, yeah. yeah. So, just quickly, um, I'm going to try and get through what movies I can quickly. So, Man on Fire, which another movie mm-hmm. I love, strictly because it's Tony Scott and Denzel Washington. Uh, what yeah. Is, what was Denzel like to work on a movie set, and what was it like to appear in a Tony Scott movie? Because... Like uh, like like yourself, I am yeah. a big Tony Scott fan. I literally grew up watching Top Gun, so I do miss wow. I do miss him yeah. when it comes to making movies. I do miss him a lot. Yeah, yeah, he was amazing. I think he was my favorite director um, because he just had such like a big personality, and he was so generous with the collaboration of things, even on the scale of the project. I. I He'd be sort of interested in my ideas. I, I had this idea that my house should be full of stuffed animals, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and there's and you'll see in the movie there's like zebras and like these animals in the house, kind of fantastic and horrendous. Um, and he, you know, he would he would facilitate that, which is sort of you know how great to be making on a movie where you can even decide that stuffed animals is a good idea and then just have that be possibility, you know, yeah. easily. Um, but also he, um, was just he, a fast thinker, a real artist. He would tr- sketch everything up so you could sort of see what he was talking about. And he loved craziness, you know, loved wackiness, very eccentric and, um, a real just dynamic, dynamic person. And I think everybody around him felt, um, inspired not intimidated by his vision and mm. and by his big personality but inspired by it yeah so I'm all, he was really great yeah. to work with because there's never really been a tony scott movie i have not actually liked i have pretty much liked all of them yeah I'm yeah sure, but i'm not I sure think the favorite, hunger. Not, yeah. Do you remember the hunger from oh, years ago oh yeah i've seen it once i think i'm pretty sure i've uh-huh. seen that yeah see that was one of the movies i watched in that art house cinema years mm. years before when I was a kid, <laughs> you know, and one of the movies I remember it. So it is kind of fantastic that eventually you get to work with these people whose movies leave, impre- you know, leave an impression. Yeah. Even early on. Um, so, yeah, he, uh, that was a great experience. Yeah. Okay. So Silent Hill, it's actually a movie based on a video game in case nobody knows what it is, but it's actually very different because... The whole thing does not revolve around shooting zombies or anything like that. It's actually about um, a mother who's trying to find her daughter. So, did you play any of the Silent Hill games to familiarise yourself with the franchise before you started? I played a bit as we, whilst we were shooting, just to get the mood of the story more than you know how you know deeply into the game. I'm not really much of a gamer, to be perfectly honest, but. Um, I just love the the sort of chilling kind of mysterious mm. feeling of that game, and I feel like the movie captured that. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it, actually, the scenes, like the sort of dramatic scenes, are really quite interesting to watch <laughs> in in the game. Um, and but Christoph, the director, was a major fan, and mm. um, he kind of altered the story a little, but he was very, you know, wanted to definitely keep. The, the whole mood of the story mm. and the music's obviously by the team that made the game and, yeah. you know, there was a lot of collaboration with the people who, who created the game. And it really is like a very dark poem. Um, everything just visually, you know, so stunning. Um, but such a weird, weird story. <laughs> you know? that, that was a really interesting, strange project and it went on for months and months. Um, but it, I think it was worth it. I mean, there's people, so many people really appreciate that film. Yeah. Um, so I think he did what he wanted to do, the director, yeah. ultimately. I still maintain that is one of the best video game adaptations ever made. Because what do we have? We have Resident yeah. Evil, Mario Brothers was a complete and utter dud. Uh, yeah. I really think the only, I say, there's only really Silent Hill that I would actually class as kind of like a, a decent video game turned into a decent movie, so... 
Yeah, I mean, it's sort of lacking in plot, but it's more like a, a dream state, you know, like a weird nightmare that yeah. does, it sort of meanders through things and it just has this very subliminal kind of effect. Um, to me, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like a weird, messy, ugly poem. Um, so I think it's always going to be, it's always going to, it's going to stand time in that sense because yeah. it is just kind of, it's very much a mood piece. So just one last subject, one last question on Silent Hill. How scary, how actually scary was Pyramid Head and would you have liked to come back for a third one if you could and if they decide to make one? I think so, yeah, just because it's such a weird story. <laughs> Anything can happen in yeah. Silent Hill. Because they, uh, yeah, they actually left the door open for a third one as well, but I don't think there's been any uh, news of it. I don't know why they don't do it. I mean, there's so many people that love the story. Um... I'm not sure why that hasn't happened. Uh, one of the producers passed as well, unfortunately, Sami Hadida, yeah. who was the producer of both of them, a French guy, a really kind of, a kind of, an also a kind of fantastic character. So I don't know if that has something to do with it and it as a franchise. But I, I heard that Christophe was looking to do the third one if they do it. That that's the director from the first, which would be great. Oh, please, um, please get him to make it. Please get him to make it. <laughs> yeah. Well, even the director from the f second one, it's interesting. Um, he, she has changed gender since directing the first one, which was interesting to me because I met, I had dinner with Sammy Hadida um, mm -hmm. and the director who um, has directed a lot of kind of action movies and so on and recently has been taking uh, hormones to change gender and has a different perspective through doing that, like mm -hmm. feels and sees the world differently. It was like a really interesting conversation. Mm, def that was definitely uh, an answer I was not expecting to hear when I was, uh, when I had in my head, that was going to ask that question. <laughs> I was not expecting that answer. <laughs> yeah, I bet you weren't expecting that. I wasn't, though. No. Yeah. Right, so uh, the crazies which was a nice uh, George Romero-style horror movie, which had you and a certain Timothy Oliphant in it. As, is that how you actually pronounce his name? Tim Oliphant, yeah. Oliphant, yeah, yeah. That's not so bad, because I've always been one of those people who are like, is that how you pronounce his name, or do you pronounce it this way? Well, but, I think that's how you pronounce it, Tim Oliphant, yeah. I've had, I've had confirmation from Rada Mitchell, everyone, that is, how you spe yeah. that is how you pronounce his last name. So what was it like yeah. working on The Crazies? Um, yeah, it was fun. It was kind of fun. We were out in, in Georgia, mm. um, so the red states, and uh, the zombies, of course, looked fantastic, so that was fun. I, I wanted to have more fight sequences with them. I think I got one in the car wash sequence, mm. which was fun. I got to, like, you know, smash the head of the zombie. But, um, uh... <laughs> That's my main, that was my main satisfying moment for the film, and also I really liked the kind of explosion at the end of the movie. Yeah, the, um, the nuclear. So I thought that looked fantastic. Um, and I also really loved the guy who shot it, um, this Italian DP who mm. was quite an elegant character, and I think brought that sort of aesthetic to it. And I think the movie worked because it was really well paced and now that you mentioned Hitchcock there there were scenes that were sort of set like Hitchcock movies like the, the camera would sort of pan across things and you'd notice details notice details and you'd know there'd be another kind of scary character in the back of the room somewhere um, so it was well kind of syncopated and choreographed mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of part of the way we were doing things all right then um would you do another movie? Because obviously you've done a movie, you've done a horror movie with George Romero. Would you do another movie with someone, say, like a uh, James Wan or a Sam Raimi? Sure. Because <laughs> the bar I have for horror, is, I'm going to be honest, it's pretty high because it's kind of like um, stuff like Saw or Freddy Alvarez's Evil Dead. I sort of set that as the bar and... To be fair, Sam Raimi, I still class as one of the godfathers of horror. So, if the opportunity yeah. came around, I'd work with them in a heartbeat. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm sort of looking to do 
more psychological horror if I'm going to do oh. horror. I just did a little movie, which I think was okay, uh, more as an experiment, super low budget, and we all kind of own part of it, everybody mm. that was part of it. Um, and it was okay. I think the script was kind of tense and... Um, uh, it, it had a sort of drama to it, but um, yeah, what's my point? I think everybody's looking to horror because they feel like they can sell it easily. Um, and yeah, it, it's good to do something a bit more sophisticated if you can yeah. within the genre, from my experience. Right, so final question, or final questions, is actually towards the... Uh, Gerard Butler style uh, Olympus and London has fallen. Was it actually easy being married to Gerard Butler? Uh, I mean, Gerard Butler is just so charming. I mean, the other day I was walking in Venice. Uh, I think it wasn't the other day anymore. It was Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And then there he was, and he was handing out. Um, little care packages to Aww. there's so many homeless people in the area and so he was just on his own time just doing that on a very personal level um so <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is um he's just like a, he's a lovely um very you know big personality but has a heart um great person to work with yeah we, we don't really get to didn't spend that much time on either of the films um so it would have been yeah, it would have been good to do more of all scenes, but the character was sort of the wife character, so yeah. there wasn't a lot to it. But that being the case, yeah, what a, he's a great person to act with, very, very spontaneous actor, you know, somebody who can just go with the flow. Yeah. Um, he, and, you know, got the movie star presence. Yeah, because one thing I absolutely love about those two movies is obviously you and Gerard, because... Your connection in that is just absolute. It's just absolutely lovely, and you just you two just bounce off each other, particularly at the uh, beginning. What was it? How many cameras did um, the, the guys give uh, you and uh, Gerard for your um, for your daughter's uh, crib? Was it six cameras? Was it? I bet you were kind oh, of like something crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, don't I know. bet you were kind of like. <laughs> I bet nobody has this many cameras in a baby's room. <laughs> yeah, well, that speaks to his character. You know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and they've done. They did a good job evolving his character too. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure where they would take it next, but uh, I'd be curious to see. And uh, there is something kind of fascinating about these disaster kind of movies. Yeah. You know, even the old Roland Emmerich ones. I was watching with a movie which I think was overlooked. What was that movie? Uh, when was the world supposed to end? Was it the day after tomorrow? Year? Was it or was? It was, no, was the one, it's the date when the world's supposed to end um, from the Mayan calendar. was not 2012. What, 2012, yeah. yeah, 2012. I watched it the other day and it was like, it was fantastic. And like it was during the sort of lockdown mm. and, you know, it's all set in LA. I was in LA and it was just so freaky to see, you know, it, it's sort of, um, I don't know why people like to see these things, but they feel so close to home and so real and so at the same time so surreal. Uh, so I think, you know, the franchise uh, plays into that. Yeah. So one last question before, unfortunately, this interview must conclude. I really don't want it to because I'm having such a lovely time. <laughs> oh, that's now, nice. um, obviously, you weren't in Angel Has Fallen, as anyone who has watched yeah. that movie will know, but they got um, Coyote Ugly's Piper Parablo. I think that's how you pronounce the name. <laughs> to replace you which yeah. I was not happy about because nobody could replace Rada Mitchell as uh, Mrs. Bannon no I know bringing so, the other yeah. blonde no it was it was disappointing and it was it was actually a really uh, tough decision I was making it in Australia uh, which is always difficult yeah. you know between time zones but um, I wanted a lot I really wanted to do the, the film um, and they kept postponing and changing the date of it and so I was supposed to do the film, um, but then it was conflicting within a week of another project, yeah. and they couldn't disappointingly figure that out. Mm. Um, so the result was that it wasn't in the film, and it, I still kind of regret it a little bit. I wish that I did that one and not the other one, but um, that's just between us. That is between us. 
Uh, just quickly, what did you think of her take of playing Leah? But I bet you secretly watched it and thought, nah, she's not as good as me. Nobody's ever <laughs> as good as me. I think she was good. I mean, honestly, um, she was great. I don't, there's nothing wrong with what she did, uh, except that I could have done it. <laughs> Go on, say it, say it. Yeah, I don't mind you saying it. <laughs> no, no, honestly, if I was a casting agent, I, there's, there's not much to the part, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Except it is nice to kind of keep the continuity of the original mm. actors. And it, it it was like I'd always wanted early in my career to, to be in a franchise, just something that just kept going. Yeah. Um, and this was that, but you know, there is something kind of also repetitive about it, and they didn't really give that character a lot of scope in any case. No. So you know, it's not like I missed out on this amazing acting opportunity, but the opportunity of, of the of the film was what I was disappointed about letting go of, just because mm. it is a great franchise and the yeah. team around it are lovely, and it would have been a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, the final thought for me is I actually thought she did a good job, but to be fair, it's kind of like when you recast someone, you really want the uh, the, act, the original actress, but you know you, you can't have her, so you just try and like yeah. the person that's replaced her. And I did. Well, like it's a little it. weird if you're if you're invested in the other story because you remember there's a continuity to the relation. Yeah. You know, it's just weird when something changes. It is, yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's not like the seminal crux it's, of the story in this case. It's not. Like. So, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately. I am actually quite sad because this is actually coming coming to an end. I know. Oh, absolutely more to Well, find. it's been lovely. Ron yeah. Mitchell from... And the... I'm impressed by the breadth of your film knowledge. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm inspired. So, just so just <laughs> finish it. Rada Mitchell, it has been an absolute joy, honour, privilege. Every single word you can think along that line. It has literally been everything. This has been a dream come true, so... Ladies and gentlemen, the first member of my bucket list I have ticked off, Rada Mitchell. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, good night.